Is it working? Are we on YouTube and Facebook? Can you confirm? We are streaming, John. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful. Welcome, Dr. Hatcher. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Great, great. So for everyone who's joining us today, Dr. John Hatcher, he is one of the Baha'is to know if you haven't heard of him already. He has written many, 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 many books. And that is an understatement. Dr. Hatcher's, uh, uh, what, what would you say, Dr. Hatcher, for what would be describing a collection of books that you've written? What, what would you call that, the noun for that? Uh, a bunch. <laughs> yes, Dr. Hatcher's bunch of books, you can find them online by just going to uh, your local bookstore and asking for books written by him. You can go to the Baha'i Publishing Trust where several books, if you just look him up as the author, you'll find a few that are listed there. And also you will find even more if you go to Amazon. So you go on my website, John, johnshatcher.com. Yes, johnshatcher.com, J-O-H-N-S, H-A-T-C-H-E-R.com. Right. There you'll find not just his books, but a vast plethora of resources. You'll find his, well, obviously his books. You'll find his videos. You'll find videos that are based off of Dr. Hatcher's books and where he expounds on the concepts that he's spoken about. You also find some related study materials that you won't find anywhere else except on his website. So his website is definitely a gold mine for information. Definitely consider looking at it. And best of all, you get to ask the guy who wrote it. So take a look at johnshatcher.com and you will see a lot. Now, the subject that we've been speaking about over the past few times uh, that we've had sessions on Sundays has been the coronavirus. That is why we started going online as a local community. Baha'is uh, in Clearwater, we decided we're going to do our programs online, keep them going rather than just not having events at the Baha'i Center and letting that be the status quo. So the pandemic has been inevitably a subject that we have been and will continue to speak about. For that reason, today's subject is the pandemic and the lesser peace an update. So this is the second presentation that Dr. Hatcher is giving, discussing the topic, the pandemic and the path to the lesser peace in depth. And in an earlier talk, he spoke about the unique conditions the pandemic had produced, some of which he remarked were not necessarily negative in their ability to awaken us to the inextricable relationship we share as citizens of a single global community, one world. In this talk, he speaks more completely about how these conditions demonstrate the sort of unexpected and unforeseen circumstances that will contribute to bringing about a secular unity that is called the lesser peace in the Baha'i writings. In the first paragraphs of The Promised Day Has Come, Shulgi Effendi, the guardian of the Baha'i faith, the grandson of Abdul Baha, great grandson of Baha'u'llah, quotes passages from Baha'u'llah about how the lesser peace will come about after humanity has experienced world engulfing tribulation. Though the writings never explain exactly what that calamity will be. The present pandemic demonstrates how such an unexpected transformative event could occur and how quickly the circumstances of the nations and the people of the world could suddenly become chaotic and uncontrollable. A quick review of the stages in the path towards a lesser peace as described by the guardian, Shogi Effendi, can help us understand what process we must go through to achieve a global polity and the stages that will lead from that secular governance 
to the establishment of the golden age of the world order of Baha'u'llah. With that said, Dr. Hatcher, we are so happy to have you here today, Cluewater Baha'is. Uh, we are hoping that uh, you can take it from here. And um, what is our subject today? You're talking to me now? Yes, Dr. Hatcher. Yes, <laughs> okay. Uh, well, the, the subject is uh, really dealing with uh, what um, might bring about uh, circumstances that would uh, establish the lesser peace. We're going to touch a little bit on what happens once that has occurred. Um, so let me uh, go ahead and share my screen and um, let me minimize the uh, uh, there. Okay. Um, so the now we see white. Okay. Soon you will see the title. There we go. Okay. American Baha'is in Time of World Power, Peril, Iraqi Road to the Lesser Peace. Uh, and this is uh, something that the, the Guardian talks a lot about in his, the last collection of his work called The Citadel of Faith. This is one of the major subjects. Um, so are you ready for me to begin? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, we are. Okay. Um, the study of Baha'i history is important for a number of reasons, uh, but in particular as regards our present circumstances, it tells us where we are in this process, uh, how we got here, uh, what the protagonists in our collective story as Baha'is or as a, w w the world uh, population are concerned. Where does our story go from here? What does the future portend? Uh, and will we have a happy ending? Uh, and if, furthermore, is the path predetermined or can we have an effect on that outcome? Because some parts of it are predetermined and some we can influence. And the writings say we can do certain things right now to not only expedite the uh, outcome of that happy ending, but also to lessen the tribulation that we must needs go through to get there. And we're gonna look at then certain terms that uh, deal with the uh, history as discussed in the Baha'i writings, uh, the cycles going from the largest to the, to the smaller ones, cycles, eras, ages, epochs, and stages. So uh, for example, the, uh, the cycle is a, a collection of dispensations are, uh, are also called errors, prophet, uh, prophetic eras, not E-R-R-O-R, -R -R, but E-R-A-S. Islam completed the Adamic, Adamic or prof prophetic cycle. Uh, uh, sometimes called the Abrahamic cycle or the uh, prophetic cycle or the Adamic cycle. The Bab uh, and the Baha'i cycle uh, begins an entirely new cycle that is destined to last 500, not fewer than 500,000 years. Now, this is not talking about the religion of the Baha'i faith. This is talking about the cycle. The Baha'i era, or the dispensation of Baha'u'llah, which began with the Bab in 1844, is destined to last at least a thousand years. Um, so that's important to know because we know that the golden age or the most great peace will have occurred by that point. So we know the, uh, uh, more definitively the uh, period of time we're dealing with. The Baha'i era is divided into three ages. So we have cycles, then a smaller thing called eras, and then a smaller division of those eras into ages. And so far we've had the heroic age. Uh, and then the, we're presently in the formative age, which will ultimately lead to the third and final age, which is the golden age. And right now we're in the fifth epoch, uh, of the formative age, which began in 2001, and we don't know how long this epoch will last. 
and we don't know when the golden age will begin. But we do know that before we get to that formative age or through the formative age, it is our purpose during this time to establish the lesser peace. Now, the lesser peace will not end the formative age, it will be a part of the formative age because it won't be the final stage. It's an intermediary stage. The stage of establishment is a point where in the meantime, during the formative age, once a, a lesser peace is established and you have a secular world government, the Baha'i administrative order will be progressing and developing simultaneously. At some point, the Guardian says, you will have the stage of establishment. And at that point, the Baha'i faith will become the um, world religion of that secular government. And then finally, you will have the most great peace, uh, which will mark the beginning of the golden age of Baha'u'llah, where the Baha'i administrative order and the secular governance will become one uh, singular uh, global polity. So what does that look like? Uh, you have the ages of the dispensation of Baha'u'llah, heroic, the formative, and the golden. Uh, you have right now where we are, uh, which is in the fifth epoch of the formative age. And then you will have at some point the lesser peace. And during that period, you will have the stage of establishment. And then finally, you will have the most great peace. Uh, in his letter to Queen Victoria, Baha'u'llah said, and of course, he's talking to all the leaders of the world. Now that you have refused the most great peace, hold ye fast unto this, the lesser peace, that happily you may in some degree better your own condition and that of your dependents. Now, he's not saying that the most great peace won't come. He's saying, he said to the leaders, if you will do certain things right now, uh, this was during the uh, 19th century. Uh, you can have the most great peace immediately without having to go through the turmoil of the lesser peace. And those things had to do with forming a, a, a pact uh, and so on. And we're going to see what that pact would have been like because that pact still has to occur in order to bring about the lesser peace. So uh, in effect, he said, you rejected the easy path now you're going to find that you'll get there but you're going to get there through great pain and suffering now notice this that the idea of having a unified global polity uh, is the result of our having established the requisite development technologically and just sociologically to sustain, not only sustain a global world government, but the, the need for it. Baha'u'llah says the earth is but one country and mankind its citizens. Well, this wasn't true before, but when he says it, he's saying now it has occurred. And now that it is one country, you need all the mechanisms and governmental organization to run what has become a single interdependent entity. In the promised day is come, uh, Baha'u'llah says, the ages of its infancy and childhood are past, never again to return. In other words, we won't have to go through this process over and over again. While the great age, the consummation of all ages, which must signalize the coming of the age of the entire human race is yet to come. The convulsions of this transitional and most turbulent period in the annals of humanity are the essential prerequisites and herald the inevitable approach of that age of ages, the time of the end. And again, as the Baha'i writings explain, where previous religions thought that meant the end of the world, uh, as in Christianity and in, in Islam, uh, the Baha'i writings say, no, it's the end of a particular period of development. But the, the birth, if you will, the birth pangs of something much more encompassing. So what is the lesser peace by definition? 
Uh, it is a, a global commonwealth secured by an international pact. Now, a pact is an agreement to which all of the constituent members agree uh, willingly, not by force, because they realize there is no other way to survive as a planet. What are the components of that pact? Well, we can go to the writings of Baha'u'llah and of Abdul Baha, we're going to look at the definition of this pact from a, a section of a book that Abdul Baha wrote in 1875 called The uh, Art of Divine Civilization, not the art, but The Secret of Divine Civilization. So I'm going to try to read this. Uh, there's three uh, slides on this. This uh, PowerPoint will be downloadable for you if you want to uh, see the slides, so don't panic if you don't get everything on a single slide. True civilization will unfurl its banners in the midmost heart of the world whenever a certain number of its distinguished and high-minded sovereigns, the shining exemplars of devotion and determination, shall for the good and happiness of all mankind arise with firm resolve and clear vision to establish the cause of universal peace. They must make the cause of peace the object of general consultation and seek by every means in their power to establish a union of the nations of the world. They must conclude a binding treaty and establish a covenant, the provisions of which shall be sound, inviolable, and definite. They must proclaim it to all the world and obtain for it the sanction of all the human race. So everyone must agree to this accord. This, this supreme and noble undertaking, the real source of the peace and well-being of the world, should be regarded as sacred by all that dwell on earth. All the forces of humanity must be mobilized to ensure the stability and permanence of this most great covenant. And this all-embracing pact, the limits and frontiers of each and every nation should be, be clearly fixed. The principles underlying the relations of governments towards one another definitely laid down and all international agreements and obligations ascertained. In like manner, the size of the armaments of every government should be strictly limited, for if the preparations for war and the military forces of any nation should be allowed to increase, they will arouse the suspicion of others. And finally, he says, the fundamental principle underlying the asylum pact should be so fixed that if any government later violate any of its provisions, all the governments on earth should arise to reduce it to utter submission. Nay, the hu human race as a whole should resolve with every power at its disposal to destroy that government. Uh, this is called the uh, uh, collaborative justice that Baha'u'llah talks about at great length. Should this greatest of all remedies be applied to the sick body of the world, it will assuredly recover from its ills and will remain eternally safe and secure. So once this is established, we will never again go back to the uh, sectarianism and uh, dis disaffection that we presently see uh, um, destroying so much of what we hold dear about our planet and its peoples. What will the secular commonwealth look like? Now, what you'll find is that um, in the book, The World Order of Baha'u'llah, Shoghi Effendi, the guardian, talks about this secular government that, that will occur at some point in the lesser peace. Some people uh, reading that uh, may confuse what he is describing with the government of the most great peace, the Baha'i government, and that's not the case. Uh, he says the commonwealth, this commonwealth of the, of the lesser peace, must, as far as we can visualize it, in other words, he's not saying this is what it will be, but he's saying it will probably contain the following parts. Uh, now, this is a chart that I made from the World Order of Baha'u'llah. Um, I think it's on page 202 that he describes these. He doesn't have a chart, but he describes the constituent uh, parts of this secular government, a world legislature, a world executive, a world tribunal, 
and of course the international force. And this is a force comprised of members from all nations so that one nation won't dominate. So it's very much like the ideal form of the United Nations. In other words, the, uh, the uh, optimism that accompanied the establishment of the United Nations included most of these uh, constituent parts. It was undermined or has been so far, it could be revived, but right now it's been undermined by a number of factors that I'll mention later. But one of them is the capacity of the founding members to veto certain things. Um, the stage of establishment, what is that? The stage of establishment I've already mentioned is a stage at which the faith of Baha'u'llah will be recognized by the civil authorities as the state religion, similar to that which Christianity entered in the years following the death of the Emperor Constantine. Uh, and that was in, I think, 380, uh, 380 AD, when the Roman Emperor uh, succeeding Constantine made the Christian religion the state religion. The world order of Baha'u'llah, the stage of establishment must later be followed by the emergence of the Baha'i state itself. Now this is eventually, uh, in other words, you will have the uh, emergence or the convergence of the secular state with the Baha'i administrative order. Functioning in all religious and civil manners in strict accordance with the laws and ordinance of the Kitab Yagdas, the most holy book, the mother book of the Baha'i revelation, a stage which in the fullness of time will culminate in the establishment of the world Baha'i Commonwealth. What will the Commonwealth of the Most Great Peace look like? So what uh, do we have any indication of what that uh, what the construction of that entity will be like. Well, uh, Shoghi Effendi says this, the Baha'i Commonwealth of the future, of which this vast administrative order is the sole framework, is both in theory and practice not only unique in the entire history of political institutions, but can find no parallel in the annals of any of the world's recognized religious systems. And he goes on after this. This is from the World Order Baha'u'llah, page 152. If you go there at your own leisure, you will find a, a very lengthy discussion, well, not extremely lengthy, but several pages long, where he talks about what, how this world order of the Baha'i Commonwealth is distinct from, has, it has certain components that are similar to those of other types of uh, political structure. Uh, and it partakes of some of them, but it's ultimately the uh, distinct from any single one of them. And I won't go into the, that so, uh, another talk. So here's what we have at the moment. This is what the Baha'i administrative order looks like. Now, Baha uh, Shoghi Effendi wrote that passage uh, in the World Order Baha'u'llah, I think it was in 1938. So he was talking even back then before you have all of the components that you have now, such as the Universal House of Justice wasn't elected then. But even as it was still envisioned then, so the blueprint for what you see right here, which is where we are now, and that's probably going to evolve and change over time, but the basic constituent parts uh, will remain the same. Uh, local uh, uh, local governments or a local house of justice, an intermediary house of justice, which we now call the, the National Spiritual Assemblies, and then a universal house of justice. Those will be the governing bodies, but what the subsidiary agencies and so on will be, uh, we don't know, but this is as far as we can uh, know uh, the closest thing to it. So in other words, the Baha'i concept of election, the Baha'i concept of nonpartisan politics, all of these policies and laws derived from the Kitab Yagdas 
will be uh, component parts of that final form. And that final form will evolve. But first, we got to establish the lesser piece. So you can't just simply jump because, to the most great piece because, as we said, we lost that opportunity. Uh, what will cause the creation of the pack that will instigate the lesser piece? So we want that pack. That pack is the key to the whole thing. That's the beginning of the lesser piece. Uh, so how do you galvanize planetary will to see the necessity of having a global government? As I say, the uh, uh, United Nations was one attempted that, the League of Nations before that was another, uh, and so on. We'll discuss that in a minute. So again, looking uh, at the heroic age, the formative age, uh, we are uh, past the heroic age, we're in the formative age, we've established the you know, complete administrative order in so far as its major constituent parts are concerned in 1963 with the election of the House of Justice. We now have the institute process uh, and uh, I've got 2021 because uh, that's the, la the end of the last of four, five, uh, five year uh, plans of the Institute process. It's not the end of the Institute process, however. And so that's, a, a, I think, a major stage in evolving and preparing the Baha'i community for the lesser peace. Uh, so what will galvanize planetary will? The ordeal. Now, what is the ordeal? Well, we mentioned it up front. Uh, that humankind on planet Earth must be so chastened by some experience that it will cause both world leaders and the populace in general to say, let's do it. Let's have a world government, no question about it, even though many people already have arrived at that conclusion. This is the passage that uh, John was uh, citing at the beginning, the very opening paragraph of the uh, promised day is come. Uh, and notice I say that the uh, ordeal has begun. This is in, written in 1941. Uh, the, the promised day is come is the name of the book and this is the promised day. And he says, a tempest, now he's quoting here from Baha'u'llah, a tempest unprecedented in its violence, unpredictable in its course, catastrophic in its immediate effects, unimaginably glorious in its ultimate consequences, is at present, in other words, it's already, and this is in 1941, it's already begun, sweeping the face of the earth. Its driving power is remorselessly gaining in range and momentum. Its cleansing force, however, mu however much undetected, is increasing with every passing day. Humanity gripped in the clutches of its devastating power is smitten by the evidences of its resistless fury. It can neither perceive its origin nor probe its significance nor discern its outcome. And so I cite here a passage about when will it become sufficiently overpowering this process as to cause us to recognize what must occur. And I quote here from, uh, uh, from Christ in Mark where he says, but of that day, and he's talking about the time of the end or the second coming, of that day and that hour no man knoweth, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. So Christ himself did not know exactly when it would occur. Uh, this is a letter written by Shoghi Effendi to an individual believer in 1949. Uh, because the more things happened, in other words, you had the Second World War now between what I just read and what was, this is eight years later, the Second World War has occurred and people are saying, was that it? Was that it? We had a nuclear, uh, a nuclear war, uh, isn't that enough? Uh, and of course you had in 1940, 
six, the establishment of the United Nations and the uh, Baha'i Faith was a, uh, a, a member of that organization, a non-voting member. And the, the Guardian said, we have no indication of exactly what nature the apop apocalyptic upheaval will be. It might be another war, but as students of our Baha'i writings, it is clear that the longer the divine physician is withheld from healing the ill of the world, the more severe will be the crisis and the more terrible the sufferings of the patient. So in other words, the more you can teach and spread the teachings of Baha'u'llah and get others to understand that, the, more, the, the less severe will be the crisis. And he goes on to say, in case some of the people were thinking, well, you already now you had the Korean War that uh, was, uh, I think it had already, uh, let's see, began, I think in 52, 53. I don't know if it was over by this point, but you had another war. And of course, that war, for those of you who don't remember or weren't alive then, that was a war fought by the UN against the uh, incursion of North Korea on South Korea. Well, uh, that seemed to be a vital expression of that pact, didn't it? Because you had all of these uh, member nations of the UN contributing forces to put down a nation that had incurred uh, on uh, had. Uh, uh, invaded the sovereignty of another nation. Um, and the Guardian says, uh, the Second World War was a foretaste of what's going to happen. So that's very frightening. Indeed, a foretaste of the devastation which this consuming fire will wreck upon the world and with which it will lay waste the cities of the nations participating in this tragic world engulfing contest, he calls it a contest, so that implies a war of some sort, has been afforded by the last world war, and that would be the second world war, making the second stage in the global havoc which humanity, forgetful of its God and heedless of the clear warnings uttered by his appointed messenger for this day, must, alas, inevitably experience. Foretaste, that's a, a very... Uh, uh, powerful term in this context. So this was written in July, 1954. Then in 1981, during the late seventies and early eighties, the Baha'i community came somewhat obsessed with the calamity because they felt like it was well overdue. And as a result, a lot of the teaching stopped because people felt like, well, the best thing I can do is go to New Zealand or make me uh, some sort of uh, outpost in the woods where I can survive the ordeal. Uh, and the House of Justice, you're going to see in a series of comments here, said the following. We are instructed to say that although there is every reason to expect that the world will experience travails and testing as never before, we do not know, uh, know what form these upheavals will take, when exactly they will come, how severe they will be, nor how long they will last. So uh, the House of Justice just says point blank, we have no idea exactly what this ordeal will be or when it will occur or how long it will endure. So in effect, don't ask us. Uh, that's not what they're saying, but that's the implicit in there is just go about your work and do the best you can because we do know the extent to which you do your work will uh, lessen the severity of that ordeal. And then this is in 76, so this is actually uh, uh, four years earlier. Uh, the House of Justice points out that Baha'u'llah in no uncertain terms has said, O oh, you peoples of the world, know verily that an unforeseen calamity followeth you, and grievous retribution awaiteth you. Think not that which ye have committed hath been effaced in my sight. Therefore it, the Universal House of Justice, considers that it would be fruitless to attempt to foresee the time or the nature of a calamity which Baha'u'llah himself was unforeseen. So how can we foresee something that's by definition unforeseen? 
Here's another letter during the same year. The House of Justice points out that calamities have been and are occurring and will continue to happen until mankind has been chastened sufficiently to accept the manifestation for this day. Abdul Baha anticipated that the lesser peace could be established before the end of the 20th century. Of course, that didn't occur. However, Baha'i should not be diverted from the work of the cause by the fear of catastrophes, but should try to understand why they occur. The beloved guardian in innumerable places has explained the reasons for these occurrences, and since they happen from time to time, as explained above, we should not be concerned as to when they occur. Now, this was responding to the fact that, as you can uh, infer, uh, from uh, the statement that Abdul Baha, in one instance, was quoted, I think it was in the Montreal Star uh, um, um, newspaper, uh, as saying that the world, that this would have been established before the end of the century. Well, we don't know if he meant the century from when he said that or a century uh, during the 20th century, but Baha'is understood it to mean the 20th century. And since we were getting at that point closer and closer to the end of the century, you can understand why the anxiety was increasing. So again, could it have already occurred? Well, I've already answered that, but just to show each stage from the beginnings of our awareness of Baha'i writings about this, the First World War was called by those in it, the war to end all wars. There wouldn't be any other wars, but unfortunately, uh, when the League of Nations was uh, proposed by and established by uh, the help of uh, President Wilson, whose daughter was a Baha'i, uh, it was undone by the oppression of the winners of that First World War over the losers. So the, uh, 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 there's no sense going into detail, but... Uh, uh, the League of Nations did not, it endured, but it didn't uh, come to fruition. In fact, the United States never became a voting member because it seemed to in, uh, intrude on our sovereignty as a nation. And so we wouldn't let anyone else tell us what we should or should not do. Uh, nationalism, again, uh, is uh, in the antithesis of this. The Second World War, well, that was incredibly more grievous and involved more people and more destruction globally. And so you had the founding in 1945, I said 46. Uh, uh, it was this, the charter was begun in 45. Uh, and it worked, as I said, in Korea. It worked in Kuwait uh, with uh, President Bush, the elder Bush waiting until he got the sanction of the UN and the participation by other UN members uh, to um, go to war with Iraq because it had invaded Kuwait. Uh, but again, uh, uh, the Gulf War in 1991, uh, was unilateral. It was the United States by itself. It didn't, didn't wait for uh, the UN or, or anyone else to join. Uh, uh, excuse me, the, the, the first Gulf War, he did. This was the elder Bush. Uh, and, and, and it was during that time that he called for a new world order and all Baha'is who heard that needless to say, were extremely excited and anticipated that peace was just around the corner, world peace, uh, because this was during a time, the 90s, when, every, when globalization was all the rage. Uh, this was an accepted ethic uh, and norm by the world community. Everyone presumed, well, we're, we're almost there. We've got a world economy, we, you know, um, a, a global community. Uh, this occurred, uh, uh, as I say humorously here, because I remember a Baha'i saying, you know, uh, this individual had gone to, uh, I think, Paris and, and found a McDonald's there and said, globalism is here. 
uh, we, we don't have to worry. Um, and of course, materially, it, it seemed that, that that was so. But it was undone once you had the Syrian uh, war, uh, the civil war in Syria, and you had this massive inter uh, immigration, which caused retrenchment and the rising again of nationalism, which is still going on. <clears throat> and now you have the pandemic. Uh, now, that would seem to um, recognize that, wait a minute, we can't rely on nationalism to solve this problem. This is a global problem. So now we're returning again, uh, even though we have this uh, blatant, it's interesting, you have the same thing that's occurring in the United States with a heavy emphasis on nationalism uh, and uh, in uh, other countries such as England and so on, where you have those powers that are struggling to uh, attain primacy that uh, are for, let's just worry about our own nation, to others that say, we've got to take care of all the people in the world. We've got to take care of the global warming. We've got to take care of the um, feeding the people. We've got to take care of the pollution of our oceans, the pollution of our air. In other words, we have so many global problems that we can no longer afford to be nationalistic. And the pandemic was sort of another um, um, what should I say, a another impetus, another source of impetus to go back to a global perspective. Some moral leaders call for a federation of governments specifically, and we'll look at those passages in a second. Will this be the crisis to galvanize the collective will of the nations? Well, it hasn't so far, but then it's not over yet by any means. And it, if, if nothing else, it will at least be uh, as I say, probably not sufficient by itself, but it will help push the envelope. You know, we push the envelope in so many areas, whether it's, as I say, pollution of water, air, ocean. Uh, we pushed it in so far as armament, armaments are concerned uh, and the threat of nuclear holocaust uh, and on and on. So some pertinent observations about this from a Baha'i perspective. If we have to ask if the ordeal has occurred, then it probably hasn't uh, and probably really shouldn't be there. Uh, if, if it's, uh, uh, it's clear from reading the Baha'i description of this event that you'll know when it happens. It is a process on the one hand that has clearly been in motion for decades. And there was a, we noticed that in the discussion by the, the Guardian in 1939, uh, that it was uh, 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 had already begun. And of course, the decline of civilization really began uh, at the turn of the previous century in the early 1900s. Um, each erroneous or backward step by world leaders return to nationalism contributes to the impetus that will hasten it, but increases the severity of the turmoil, turmoil that will be inflicted by it when it does come. All that we do to create vital spiritual and autonomous communities as Baha'is will lessen its ultimate impact and the subsequent suffering of humankind. So what is the, uh, the pandemic contributing? It is unforeseen, so that complies with one of the criterion for the ordeal. It is world engulfing, it complies with that requirement. Its solution clearly requires global collaboration, so that's a, a very important point of uh, impetus that it contributes. It clearly demonstrates the failings of nationalism and all those nations that attempt to deal with it uh, nationally and so on have failed miserably. And of course, it's on re in resurgence now throughout the world. 
it does not involve the tyranny of one group or nation. And that's something distinct about it. It's not a matter of uh, uh, evil people. It's an unforeseen calamity. It seems to be urging leaders of thought to consider a world federation of governments for both the exigencies of world crises and as the only path to any sort of world justice. And here I'm going to show you three different individuals from totally different backgrounds. Well, not totally different backgrounds, but they're all government or ex-governmental officials who have observed as a result of the pandemic, the necessity of a global government. Gordon Brown, the former prime minister of England, has urged world leaders to create a temporary form of glo global government to tackle the twin medical and economic crises caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. The former labor leader prime minister who was at the center of the international efforts to tackle the impact of the near meltdown of the banks in 2008. That was the recession as a result of the burst, bur bursting uh, of the uh, real estate uh, bubble, said there was a need for a task force involving world leaders, health experts, and the heads of the international organizations that would have executive powers to coordinate the response. Now, this is a, a, a uh, a temporary thing he is proposing. But Miguel, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, in April of this year, when the pan pandemic was underway, made an incredible statement. Now, those of you who don't know, and I presume most of you do, he was the former and final uh, head of the Soviet Union before the Soviet Union uh, Broke, broke up into uh, the various nation, nation states that comprised it. Uh, but an extremely intelligent man and a, a very capable leader he was. The eighth and last leader of the Soviet Union, the General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union from 1985 until 1991 said the following, during the first months of this year, we have seen once again how fragile is our global world. Now listen to this carefully because this could be said by uh, any Baha'i, but it would have to be a very articulate Baha'i. How great the danger of sliding into chaos. The COVID-19 pandemic is facing all countries with a common threat and no country can cope with it alone. The immediate challenge today is to defeat this new vicious enemy. But even today, we need to start thinking about life after it retreats. So he's not banking the solution to world problems on defeating this. Uh, he just sees this uh, uh, as the same way I'm talking about it as one more uh, evidence of the need for uh, global polity. Many are now saying the world will never be the same. But what will it be like? That depends on what lessons will be learned. I recall how in the mid 1980s, we addressed the nuclear threat. The breakthrough came when we understood that it is our common enemy, a threat to all of us. The leaders of the Soviet Union and the US declared that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. Then came Reykjavik and the first treaties eliminating nuclear weapons. But even though by now, 85% of those arsenals have been destroyed, the threat is still there. Yet another, other global challenges remain and have even become more urgent, poverty and inequality, the degradation of environment, the depletion of the earth and the oceans, the migration crisis, and now a grim reminder of another threat, diseases, and epidemics that in a global interconnected world can spread with unprecedented speed. The response to this new challenge cannot be purely rational, national, excuse me, while it is the national governments that now bear the brunt of making difficult choices. Decisions will have to be made by the entire world community. 
What we urgently need now is a rethinking of the entire concept of security. Even after the end of the Cold War, it has been envisioned mostly in military terms. Over the past few years, all we've been hearing is talk about weapons, missiles, and airstrikes. This year, the world has already been on the brink of clashes that would involve great powers. With serious hostilities in Iran, Iraq, and Syria. And of course, uh, doesn't mention North Korea, which was also uh, and still is uh, a threat. <clears throat> and though the participants eventually stepped back, it was the same dangerous and reckless policy of brinksmanship. Is it not clear by now that wars and arms race cannot solve today's global problems? War is a sign of defeat, a failure of politics. And then he concludes with the following. The overriding goal must be human security, providing food, water, and a clean environment, and caring for people's health. To achieve it, we need to develop strategies, make preparations, plan and create reserves. But all efforts will fail if governments continue to waste money by fueling the arms race. I'll never tire of repeating we need to demilitarize world affairs, international politics, and political thinking. To address this at the highest international level, I am calling on world leaders to convene an emergency special session of the UN General Assembly to be held as soon as the situation is stabilized. It should be about nothing less than revising the entire global agenda. Specifically, I call upon them to cut military spending by 10 to 15%. This is the least they should do now as a first step towards a new consciousness, a new civilization. And of course, needless to say, what excites me about this and should excite you is that he's calling for that very pact that Abdul Baha described in 1875. Finally, the Secretary General of the UN says, and this is succinct, but it's a beautiful, beautiful series of metaphors. The world is at a breaking point. This pandemic has been likened to an X-ray revealing the fractures and the fragile, fragile skeleton of the societies we have built. It is exposing, exposing fallacies and falsehood everywhere. The lie that free markets can deliver health care for all, the fiction that unpaid care work is not work, the delusion that we live in a post racist world, the myth that we're all in the same boat. Because while we're all floating on the same sea, it's clear that some are in super yachts while others are clinging to the floating debris. It's very poetic, that last one it rhymes. With that. Isn't that incredible? That last metaphor just says it all so succinctly. So, the anatomy of the Baha'i approach. Every institution of this divinely created order is one more refuge for a distraught populace. Every soul illumined by the light of the sacred message is one more link in the oneness of mankind, one more servant ministering to the needs of an ailing world. Even should the Baha'i communities in the years immediately ahead be cut off from worlds, the world center or from one another, as happened, of course, in Iran, as some already have been. And of course, this is a year after the Iranian revolution. The Baha'is will neither halt nor hesitate. They will continue to pursue their objectives, guided by the spiritual assemblies and led by the counselors, the members of the auxiliary boards and their assistants. And so here we finish up with the divine logic of the institute process in light of this ordeal. What does it accomplish? Well, these are just my own observations from participating in it and seeing what it can do that we were never able to do as well before. It instigates a skeletal framework to embrace an increasingly dysfunctional secular global polity. The autonomy of each community or cluster 
uh, allows for compliance with and utilization of local exigencies. The basic components of community life at every level uh, have been increased with education uh, at every level provided by the uh, sequence of uh, institute courses, collective worship, uh, governance and guidance provided by the LSAs, immediate implementation without the need for governmental awakening to the global needs. In other words, it's not a top-down kind of imposition of guidance. It is a guidance in which we are encouraged to build from the ground up, totally different. And what about the transition from the lesser peace to the most great peace? What processes will occur then? Well, we mentioned the stage of establishment as one of those, but that will have to be another talk for another time. Though if you don't want to wait, you can look at two books I've written. Uh, one, The Ascent of Society, The Global Imperative and Personal Salvation, and God's Plan for Planet Earth and for Your Neighborhood. Uh, both of these are available on Amazon or through the Publishing Trust. And I discuss that uh, the transition, the stages uh, that are talked about in the writings in those books. And there is the uh, uh, website where you can locate those books and discussions of them. And so that, my friends, is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. I will stop sharing my screen now and I will let uh, John take over and uh, convey to me any questions that uh, if you have questions, put them in the chat uh, and uh, I will have John read them to me. And uh, if you want to uh, be anonymous, uh, send them to John specifically um, and that will uh, secure your anonymity. So, John? Yes, so we have one question at the moment from an anonymous person. It is this question. <laughs> is the decline of civilization marked by the widening of gaps between ages, fall of institutions like religious, family, primitive barriers, and lack of morality? So uh, this is a big question, huh? So um, I want to break it down to, to one question and, and then uh, carry it as uh, segments. Is the decline of civilization marked by the widening of gaps between ages, fall of institutions like religious? So. Uh, well, I can, I can answer it the way it was phrased. Uh, okay. uh, those are both causes and effects. I would say the first one, the uh, the gaps, the generation gaps and attitudes and, norm, and, and norms from one generation to another, uh, I would say that's largely an effect. Uh, the decline of family values and so on, also an effect. And you can say they're causative, but uh, again, the, they are the result of the decline of any unified perspective about what is the essential nature of the human being. And of course, as Baha'is, we start there and say, well, the soul, and therefore we focus on developing spiritual virtues in order to secure our own development spiritually. But we, as the title of that first book I mentioned that I wrote, uh, as I imply in that book, uh, individual spiritual development cannot be accomplished without your involvement in society. So I, I would say that th those are, yes, they're causative, but they're mostly results of, of the general breakdown of uh, uh, universally accepted norms of, of uh, well, we, can, we could go on, but I think that's clear enough. So here's another anonymous question. Education is moral and material. And also uh, in the institute process, 
How can Baha'is provide the moral education that's needed? Well, the institute process, of course, um, is designed just for that. I mean, you have not only the children's classes and the study circles for every age, but you also have the junior youth and the spiritual animation program, which is extremely vital. So you have the, the four core activities of the children's classes, devotions, the study circle, and the junior youth animation program. So, I mean, these four core activities, if carry it out, systematically within a community, there's your resource at the local level to do just that. But of course, going back to the previous question, it has to be reinforced by the family uh, and the community. Uh, and this is something needless to say, we could discuss uh, at great length. But uh, I think, yeah, I mean, that's one of the exciting things about the Institute process is the resources you need for building from the ground up are right there. I remember, uh, and I stated this in one of my books, but I remember going uh, uh, on a plane to a, uh, a meeting of the regional uh, uh, council that I was serving on at the time. And a, and a man asked me, so, you know, there, there are two questions that one you love to hear and one you, you used to fear. One is, so what is this Baha'i faith? Well, you can describe that fairly easily. It's, uh, you know, uh, uh, we believe in uh, that all the religions are really one religion revealed in progressive and successive stages and so on. The unity of God, the unity of humankind and so on. But the second question is, is not so much fun. And so what do you do? Or where is your church? <laughs> and well, we have, uh, you know, it used to be that you would sort of mumble around. Well, sometimes we have a, uh, uh, a display at the county fair. Or we have uh, uh, a fireside at Mrs. Jones's house. Uh, you know, this doesn't sound like a, a world revitalizing <laughs> endeavor. But now you can say uh, uh, in every community around the world, we have these four things going on. Uh, you, you, if you'll tell me where you live, you can, I can give you a, a, a phone number or a, a, a URL where you can see, you can find out where the nearest uh, um, study circles are in your community and so on. So we have systems now that uh, both enhance and facilitate the institute process. Uh, so in every community, you will have someone responsible for receiving phone numbers from people who've given their information at the national level on that website. And then that, the national, uh, uh, um, I've forgotten the name offhand of, of, of the service, but uh, you know, we'll feed that to the individual responsible at the local level. And with a day, in a day or two, that individual will be contacted and will be uh, uh, offered uh, courses or just an individual visit or uh, whatever. So uh, um, I forgot what the question was now, but, but I think I must have answered it because I talked a long time. <laughs> Yes, it was, it was about uh, how Baha'is can provide the moral education. Moral, yeah, the moral education. And, and I'm not saying that, you know, it, it's easy. It's hard work. Uh, and, and the fact is that um, you, you cannot, um, there's, I think most of the initial resistance to the Institute process has dissipated. I hope it has. If it hasn't, then those who resist it will eventually die off <laughs> because 20 years have, have passed since, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, that sounds cruel and ruthless. But what I mean is that 20 years have passed since we introduced this thing, uh, this system, and it has developed so that in some villages, as you've seen on some of the films from the World Center, in some villages and remote areas, the Baha'i faith is the governing body for that village and that where they hold their courses and classes and the LSA meeting, that's where the governance for that village 
uh, I mean, that is the governance for that village. So you have examples of visions of the future, uh, of how it could be. I'll say one more thing, and this relates to both that and, and my talk. I was once asked after I gave a talk, this was, uh, um, I've mentioned this before, but uh, uh, I was giving a talk in, uh, in Hollywood uh, or promoting a book of mine when we used to do that sort of thing. Um, and an individual asked, well, you know, he couldn't conceive of, of uh, what kind of ordeal would, would change the hearts of, uh, of individuals and, and I, uh, you know, would, and would uh, stop the materialism and, and the fascination with, you know, your iPhone and so on. I said, shut off the electricity. Shut off the electricity and see how many days it takes for LA to be in utter chaos. And um, so at any rate, all you have to do is think of a squirrel getting on the grid and shorting out. And this has happened before, of course, it didn't last terribly long. But if you've ever been without electricity, you, you realize that the people living in those remote villages who have none are probably going to feel the ordeal a lot less than someone living in the uh, vast complex matrix of uh, big city life where everything you need seems readily available. And yeah, uh, the, the idea of the squirrel, that, that seems very familiar <laughs> to USF Tampa. <laughs> the unforeseen squirrel. <laughs> yes. I, I don't think they've gotten rid of that in the past 50 years. Uh, <laughs> I think they're still going through it now. I haven't checked in yet, but <laughs> squirrels, they, they are an issue at USF, I'll tell you. <laughs> and for those who didn't know, uh, Dr. John Hatcher is also a professor emeritus of the University of South Florida in Tampa. Um, it's a very beautiful campus indeed, full of trees and squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> so here is- It used to be full of feral cats too, I remember. Yeah, they got rid of the cats. I oh, don't remember good, seeing okay. cats. <laughs> so uh, speaking of USF, we, we have a, a, a ex-USF student, aka graduated. Um, uh, Vin, are you able to ask your question? You you sent your... oh. Vin is okay not to be uh, uh, anonymous. I yeah, I was, try I was trying to turn my mute off, sorry. <laughs> Uh, hi, Dr. Hatcher. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you doing? Uh, I'm I'm doing well. I'm doing well myself. Uh, my question. Let me let me pull it up here in a second. Uh, in terms of ushering in a new era of galvanizing a movement toward a unified world order, uh, how would you suggest uh, controlling for those rogues and renegades in the equation who would prefer not to play nice, so to speak? Ah. Uh... Well, it depends on whether you're talking about, <clears throat> I mean, that's a, that's a very broad question because you have renegades at so many levels, all right? Yeah, what yeah. level are you talking, Ben? Are you talking individual or national? Uh, well, I mean, I guess national, because you, you hear about government corruption all the time. Oh, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Yeah, well, I mean, in individuals question, make right? up a government too. So yeah. I guess individual as well. Yeah, I, 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 I think that's, to, to put, I, it sounds very pessimistic and negative, but I think that's why the Bahrain say that whatever this ordeal is will have to be so um, frightening and so galvanizing that the last thing you'll think of is 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 uh, uh, touting yourself above others or interrupting somebody else. You, you, you know, you, you have this strange thing that happens when peril strikes a community, that people seem to come together and things like that seem to dissipate to the extent they can. 
So if you're talking about the community level, obviously, in other words, you, you, you're still, you're going to have stratification on a global community. You're going to have local communities, you're going to have territorial uh, areas of interest uh, and so on. And that's why there are three levels of governance in the society that the Baha'i writings describe, the local, the territorial, or intermediary, and the universal. Uh, so uh, you will have, uh, as I mentioned, one of the constituents of this world polity will be a global policing force. Uh, so that would take care of a rogue nation uh, because it would be a force of sufficient power, though it would be comprised of uh, con uh, um, contributing members from every nation. So you wouldn't have, in effect, any sort of uh, East, West, uh, uh, or uh, you, you wouldn't have any sort of distinctive uh, um, interest that would uh, disable it. Uh, so that would take care of it on a national level and take care of it pretty quickly, because if you knew that, and especially if you knew by demonstration that if you do this, you will not notice that the, the writings that I read up front from al Baha doesn't say that they should be punished or um, you should take away certain privileges from the nation. They should utterly destroy that government, uh, not the people, but the government. Um, so if, if you do that, if you, and you do it, you know, uh, uh, in the right way, I guarantee you that a nation is not going to kill itself that way. But at the, at the local other levels and so on, most, I think, and this may be naive on my part, but I think most of what you're seeing in the way of, for example, uh, um, uh, say right wing groups are uh, uh, are left wing groups that uh, attempt uh, violent demonstrations and so on are not attempt they they have violent demonstrations are prepared to go to war and we may see this occur after this election we don't know I mean we're really at a very critical time in the history of this nation right now regardless of how the election goes. Most of those people have grievances. And while some of them just want to, to make trouble because they got nothing else to do and they're angry, maybe because they didn't have a happy home life, a lot of them are angry for what they perceive to be legitimate reasons. And their ways of redressing the grievances of people, regardless of what their grievances are. If they don't want people telling them what to do or so on, you, you know, would you create a society that basically responds to the needs that people have? Uh, you get rid of the need for to rebel against the society as a whole or even parts of it. So it, it, it's, um, I think most violence comes from anger and most anger comes from some sort of problems that one has incurred. So they come from the family where you have the, the rogue individual, or they come from the community where you have the disenfranchised group, or they come from the nation where you have a disenfranchised uh, uh, race, uh, or so on. So all of those have to be dealt with, and all of those concerns are included uh, in the Baha'i writings and in the description of the community that this world polity would uh, include. I hope that helps, but suffice to say, it's a very complex question, but uh, uh, it's certainly understood. It's not, it may sound naive, but in the midst of crisis, it, it, it is not. And, and I yeah. think referring to the fact that we, you and I are talking right now uh, via the Baha'i community. Well, well the Baha'i community is not a congregational religion. That's important because if we were a congregational religion, what would we be doing? I don't know. 
Instead, we're a community-based religion, and so the community is sticking together, and whether hook or crook, we're helping each other, and we're still functioning. We would love to be together physically, but until we can, we've got a way, if the electricity goes, we'll find some other way of, of uh, seeing to the needs and, uh, and so on of others. Any other questions? Yes. So uh, we have a question, uh, two part, very important from Clearwater. Uh, it's a very deep question. And I think uh, you may take interest in this as well very much. Now, here's a two part question. If the Baha'i religion has the prophecies of coming calamities and solutions, as well as a blueprint for a future society and the methodology for transitioning to this new world order, why is it that we cannot convince Baha'is not to engage in partisan politics? And instead of engaging in politics that, partisan politics that re results in no productive influence in society, study and educate themselves on the core holy Baha'i text, the Baha'i scripture. And the second part of the question, why can we not create this futuristic Baha'i community to be the example of the world that is currently failing, that it could turn to, the example it can turn to? Gotcha. All right, well, uh, in case I forget the second question, do you, you remember it so you can remind mm -hmm. me, but all right. Uh, the first question again, uh, remind me. To, uh, yes. So the first part is, since the Baha'i faith, we believe, has a oh, blue gotcha. I remember. Okay. society. Okay. Yeah, the answer to the first question is very simply this. Baha'is are, and th this is kind of a silly thing to say, but Baha'is are misfits. Uh, for the most part, we're misfits in that we have discovered something unusual that most people aren't aware of that we find comforting, but be, because we didn't find every, we weren't satisfied with what, with the, with the norm, with what was going on. So I don't mean we're misfit in a bad way. We're independent, largely as individuals, we, we think for ourselves. And, and I don't mean that in a, a braggadocio kind of way. I just mean that in order to become a Baha'i, which is unusual, it's a strange sounding name and so on. Uh, number one, you have to know what you're doing and why you're doing it and be willing to answer questions about what is that and why are you that and so on. So m m the majority of Baha'is uh, are very thoughtful about why they're Baha'is and what that means. However, you have an incredible array of, of, uh, of learning and, and depth among all those Baha'is. So you have some who are nominally Baha'is because the parents were Baha'is. You have those who suddenly found it and are, are, are in love with it dearly and, and cherish it. And you have those who uh, are very articulate about it and so on. So you have a vast array of people. Uh, but the, the very thing that makes someone attracted to something different is also the thing which would make them resist uh, uh, not uh, being told, don't express yourself on this particular issue because it'll be more detrimental than helpful. And so one of the things Baha'is are told is, we do not become involved in partisan politics. Now, there's a whole discussion behind that. And the discussion has to do with the fact that in the future and presently in Baha'i administration, Baha'i elections are sacrosanct. There is no uh, nomination. There is no politicking. There are no parties. It's a plurality vote. Uh, the Baha'i organization administration is structured such that it is literally impossible to try to attain power in the Baha'i faith. And I can discuss that with you for a long time if, if you want, uh, why that is so. But the Baha'u'llah has structured it so that the desire for power will get you ashes or it'll get you anonymity, at the, uh, 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 if nothing else. 
uh, the, I, I can simply underscore that by saying, name me more than two people on the House of Justice. That's the highest organization in the Baha'i world. Uh, and yet nobody knows who they are because they uh, do their work uh, anonymously and as a group, and there are no individuals of power in the Baha'i faith. So, uh, we are told don't become involved in partisan politics because the values you have in so far as Baha'i elections should be the same values you have in secular society. And that is, you don't try to tell someone else how to vote. You don't try to influence them. It is a matter of your own conscience uh, and, uh, and your own independent autonomous thinking about it. And so you wouldn't, in a, in a Baha'i election, you would not dare hint to someone whom they should or should not vote for, for an assembly or for uh, another level of administration. Those same principles should apply insofar as the secular elections uh, uh, are concerned. And so we uh, are forbidden to do that. The fact that some Baha'is do it means they're not doing the right thing. Some Baha'is... Uh, 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 Break Baha'i laws. Uh, the assembly, there are means for taking care of that. And that is the local assembly, if they see this happening and it becomes uh, uh, persistent and obnoxious, uh, they should uh, get in touch with this individual. If it, this individual is in their community, talk to them and tell them to stop. The failure to adhere to Baha'i law can carry sanctions with it. So, there is a, there is a Baha'i uh, uh, means of dealing with those who do not abide by Baha'i law. So you have so that's the simple answer. People don't always do what they should. Neither do Baha'is. You, when you become a Baha'i, you don't have to be a, a perfect person. Coming Baha'i is simply deciding I want to try and become better than I am, and I want to use this religion as the tool or the principal means by which I accomplished that. It doesn't mean you've accomplished it already. And so people very innocently have a visceral reaction to very visceral things that are happening. Uh, how can you not react? Well, it's hard. It's hard in the same way that you're not supposed to strike another person. But what if someone strikes you or someone strikes your husband or wife or something? Uh, so it's it's not easy. The second question was what? Yes. So the second part, uh, the same person preludes, uh, the prelude of the question was, Muhammad said that the person who is eating a date cannot forbid it to others. Others cannot be forbidden that date if you're the one who's eating it as well. And Abdul Baha said, you can only succeed if you practice the Baha'i ethics yourself. This question, why can't we create this futuristic Baha'i uh, community that is to be the example for the world that is currently failing? That's exactly what the Institute process is attempting to do. But as I say, what the House of Justice realized, I presume, I, I wasn't present when they decided to do the Institute process, was that you can't legislate morality from the top down. It just doesn't work because you've got to have a method, number one, and you can't coerce people to be good. They've got to desire it. And so it has to blossom, if you will, from the ground level up. And so that's precisely what the Institute process is doing. It's saying, let's create uh, exemplary communities. And these aren't meant to be just Baha'i communities. Uh, as anyone knows who knows anything about the Institute process, is to include uh, development of, of spiritual communities, including those who aren't Baha'is and assisting those who aren't Baha'is. So you, that's uh, uh, the first building block of social order is the neighborhood, the community. It's always been so. It will always be so. That's why we you know, our world citizens, we live at the local level. And that's where we want our uh, peace to, uh, uh, and, and uh, tranquility to be experienced and, uh, and, and work for. So that's precisely what we're supposed to do. 
is to do it at the local level. Why can't we do it on a grander level? Well, we are uh, uh, have a very important voice at the UN. Uh, the House of Justice sends letters to uh, the various governments and so on. Uh, the Baha'i Center in the Holy Land is an, is an incredible expression of beauty, unity, and power uh, of a spiritual kind. Uh, the Baha'i organization itself uh, is exemplary as well. So um, but at both the local level and the grander level, we're trying to do that as best, best we can. But we're spread out, you know, so uh, it's not something you, um, I'll put it this way, the more degraded our communities become in the secular level, the more outstanding will be the example of the Baha'i neighborhood and the Baha'i community. And you see, that's why you see it spread so rapidly and quickly in impoverished nations, because there is no other order around. We have dis we have order in, in uh, say, America or Florence. Uh, we may not like it very much, but it's you know you have an electric system, a water system, a community council, and so on. But in the impoverished nations uh, where the villages have the Baha'i faith spreading so rapidly, it's because they are that is the that example does stand out and it stands out as not only uh, a beautiful way of life, but really as the only organized uh, life. Well, I didn't say that well, but there, again, there's some beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, videos of uh, the communities, <clears throat> Baha'i communities worldwide, and you see how it functions in communities and uh, remote villages in the middle of uh, busy metropolitan areas and so on. So it doesn't, it's not contingent on a particular environment. Thank you. Um, that, uh, that means a lot. And I think a lot of people watching this, that, that question will uh, resonate with them because it's, uh, I feel a sentiment that a few people have for sure. And um, it's, it's a difficult question as well because uh, you know better than most, um, it's, a, uh, it's a concept that people are looking at themselves introspectively as well as looking at their community around them and wanting to do the right thing. So the next question. Well, to continue uh, what you're just saying there and to do the right thing, you have to have a means of doing it. You have to have a mm -hmm. path. Yeah, okay. which is what's implicit in what you said. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Indeed. Uh, this question is from Ali Khajavi. I don't know what community he's from, but I, I, uh, I'll tell you the question. So here we go. The question is, when I read Shoghi Effendi writing sometimes, I sense the Third World War is inevitable. What are your thoughts about it? Thanks. Um, I, I would like to add that uh, uh, it's a question I actually can say that I also have, having read uh, Priceless Pearl, where Ria Khanum cites Shoghi Effendi and the use of nuclear armaments, that if it were to come to that point, there's no doubt they would be used. Um, it's an interesting subject. And uh, what, what is your uh, gleanings on this subject? I, did, I have read nothing more than what you have, and in in it's stated. It is stated in Priceless Pearl, uh, where he he doesn't say yes, there will be, but he says it's likely that that the calamity will involve a a third world war. Um, of course, any war will be a world war uh, because it, it, if there is a war and a nation is threatened, it will use the best weapons it has. And if they're nuclear, then it pollutes, it affects the entire, the entire world. Uh, I, I, again, to, uh, I, I have no more idea about that than anyone else does. I, I was simply, 
I'm comforted by what the House of Justice said when it says we don't know what form it will take, how long it will endure, <laughs> uh, wh when it will occur. In other words, if the House of Justice doesn't know, I, don't, I certainly can't presume that I know either. Uh, and I don't know that, then I don't think the Guardian knew. Uh, well, it's, it's intriguing because it uses the word unforeseen. So the word foreseen, we know that there is ingredients there and it's very, uh, it, it's, it's not just hindsight's 2020, it's looking at it, you see that it's foreseeable that such an action will occur. Say you have a wet floor, someone slips on the wet floor, that's foreseeable. Whereas this is unforeseeable. So to say, say unforeseeable, unforeseen, meaning at this moment we don't foresee it, but it doesn't mean it won't say, oh, we should have thought of that. Um, I, I don't know what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. And it's uh, it's it's interesting because it seems to mean that the mechanism to deal with that problem when it comes isn't there. So when that problem comes and the mechanism is not there, people will see the clear need for the mechanism, which is a world system to deal with world problems. Uh -huh. And, and, you know, uh, something I've said when I've answered this question in other forums uh, is that um, it, it, there's a kind of domino effect that could occur. And that is many of the multitude of problems we just mentioned, and that is pollution of air, pollution of oceans, natural resources, destruction of natural resources, uh, lack of housing, lack of, you know, uh, of, uh, of um, shelter, clothing, everything, you know. All of these uh, we've pushed to the limit so that, you know, we have scientists say, if we don't do thus and so by this date, then this damage will be permanent or, or unrecoverable, or, you know, irreparable. So one scenario that seems the most likely is that just one collapsing, you know, that all of them collapsing at once, all of these, the, the envelopes having been pushed so that any one of them could cause the, the ultimate uh, outcome of, of them all. Uh, as I say, to me, the simplest answer is electricity. <laughs> and that is, you get rid of electricity. And, and, and of course, we, we know, or at least theoretically, that a nuclear explosion in the atmosphere, as I recall, uh, you probably know this better than I, uh, uh, knocks out what transistors or it, it, it destroys um, some part of the- And to what level of the electrical system you're talking? Again, like you mentioned about the world, <laughs> individual to national, it yeah. depends at where it occurs. Yeah, but I mean, uh, so, I mean, uh, well, never mind. It, as I say, the one thing that is, is for sure, insofar as the Baha'i perspective is concerned, we know that it's going to occur, but we also know that it's a waste of time to speculate about when it will occur or what exactly it will be. We do know the best use of our time is to create these communities as models, as the question, uh, the uh, person giving the question a few minutes ago said, what can we do to exemplify uh, in real time the value of the Baha'i faith and the Baha'i teachings? And then that's the community life. So, I mean, we know that the, the answer, and I've read some passages from the House of Justice about that, the best thing we can do is to do exactly what the House of Justice guides us to do in so far as creating community life as an example. We can't, we can't correct what is uncorrectable. We can't repair a system that is irreparable, that is based on fallacious uh, theories to begin with. We just can't. You know, so we may hope that, well, democracy in America seems to be a thing of the past. Uh, 
but maybe if uh, we can recover it, you know. Well, I don't know whether we recover it temporarily or not, but I do know that it's uh, it's not a system sufficient to help the entire world because not the entire world has the American system. So even if the American system as it is corrects itself better or so on, it doesn't mean that the, the, the globally that, I mean, you've got, uh, as, as I'm sure you know, if you read, read the news or listen to the news or watch the news, that you have uh, rebellions and attempts to over, you know, you're redoing the constitution in, where is it, Venezuela or Bolivia? Uh, they're, they're, re they're voting to redo the constitution there. There is uh, in Kiev, I think uh, they have uh, had, uh, they're rejecting the uh, results of the election there. I Forgive me, but I, off the top of my head, I can't pull, but, in other words, you have you're, you're having uh, problems with uh, look at France. What's happened there in the last week? Uh, you know, with the, the tensions arising there, which go all the way back to Algeria, when France was when Algeria was a, a, a subject nation to to France and the the uh, injustices that were done there. That's deep seated. Look at England, everything. Every nation is struggling to figure out, not just because of the pandemic, but because of the inequities. You know, this is one thing we hadn't mentioned, the vast gulf between the, those who have and those who, who have not. I swear that analogy that the uh, Secretary General used is so good. We're all in the same sea, but some are on the super yacht and some of us are, are just clinging to the debris. Uh, you, that can't last long. Uh, I mean, just, uh, uh, I don't mean d d morally, I mean, physically, socially, that condition will not endure before you have some, some change. This is Venezuela, says someone, that they have a, the new constitution. And also Chile is doing a renewal of the constitution as well. Okay. So you, here again, you see attempt to to correct injustices to make uh, uh, the the second level of governance, the the territory or the nation, saner, more just, more more equitable, and so on. Let's take about one more, and then I think we better close up. Yeah, that sounds great. And this is something uh, you've already spoken about, but uh, it's been asked, and I think it's a great closer question. And this is about epochs. So how is an epoch defined? Where, Or at least after uh, watching this, where can they find information on it? Uh, especially, how are we in the fifth epoch? Uh, okay. Are there a number of epochs mentioned in the writings of um, how many epochs before the lesser peace or the most great peace? Um, yeah, uh, I don't have it in my hand what I would like. Uh, there is a wonderful uh, little uh, booklet that was put out by Paul Lampel uh, in, uh, uh, I forget, uh, Leilani Smith, I believe. But at any rate, it, it, was, uh, uh, it shows a graph uh, indicating the different epochs and what happened in with each plan uh, of the uh, uh, of the guardian, and then of the uh, the house of uh, the house of justice, uh, the various global plans and so on, epochs. The house of justice decides at what point we have a reached a new epoch. So it's not arbitrary, but it's not fixed. We don't know. In other words, they decided that. The fifth epoch we're in began with the institute process because they decided, I presume, that this was to be such a dramatic change or addition to our uh, revision of Baha'i life that it marked a different stage in the progress of the formative age. They decide that. Okay, so the source that you mentioned is it some insights from the first century of the formative age by Paul Lample in the Association for Baha'i Studies article or no? I, 
I don't remember. I don't remember. Okay. Well, there's a 2016 uh, uh, writing from Paul Lample, uh, which discusses epochs, some insights from the first century of the formative age. I, I haven't read that, but that sounds like it would include it. The book I'm talking about was a <clears throat> booklet that he wrote before he was elected to the House of Justice, and it was just a, a very short, a very short pamphlet-like thing, and it had an insert on it that had okay. a one, wonderful graph that showed what were the goals of this plan and how and were they achieved and so on. All right, <clears throat> let's see. We've got. Would it be a, a possible to share the uh, the PowerPoint uh, for everyone? And yes, uh, um, I'll download this uh, um, this talk onto my website and I think Clearwater will have it on theirs mm -hmm. but I will make on my website available the uh, the PowerPoint I will save it in a uh, PDF format uh, rather than a PowerPoint format but that's just as valuable so all the slides will be available yes Beautiful, All beautiful. Right. So it will be on johnshatcher.com. Yes. The materials. And uh, it'll be under, there's two, well, it's a subsite called uh, Talks Through the Years. Uh, there's one on my courses where I have those. And then also I have a YouTube channel that it'll be on too. Uh, so can people find this link through? They'll find the, the links to everything on that website. Okay, beautiful. Yeah, they'll have the, the talks, they'll have access to the talks and to the PowerPoints and to the YouTube channels. Okay, right. thank you, friends. I've enjoyed it. I always enjoy you dealing with the Clearwater uh, community. Very, uh, uh, very good. Uh, particularly like seeing the, uh, the bridge there in the background. <laughs> 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 well, you have to like the Sunshine Skyway. It's like one of the longest underrated bridges you can ever have. It, I'm not sure if you can see it right there. Yes, I see it. I can't ah. see the little strand so well. I think, well. Hold it. I think someone's about to jump off. There they go. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, so goes it. All right, friends. I will uh, leave now and uh, my best to everyone. Allah Thank you, John.